Good morning, friends. This is Michelle, and welcome to my June edition of Tea With Me. So this morning, um, before I start, my tea of choice is in celebration of my upcoming trip to the UK, which I'm so excited about. So I am having um, the twining or twinning, I don't know how you say it, maybe my English friends can tell me, I'm having the original English breakfast tea. And since it says that I'm supposed to have a splash of milk in my tea, I did that, even though I'm not generally somebody who puts um, milk in my tea, but it's actually very good. So I'm very excited about my upcoming trip to London. It's the first time I'm going abroad. I didn't really have the opportunity to do things like this when I was my son's age or younger. Um, I grew up on a homestead and we had animals and and uh, we had gardens and you just didn't do things like this. Who was going to do all that work? And we did occasionally go on vacations, but it was very difficult to do so. so um, I was so excited when my son had the opportunity to travel abroad last fall and he studied in the South Bank of London and everybody asked if we were going to go over and see him, but his, um, semester was so short and busy and he wanted to travel. So we didn't go over and see him when he was there. So he's taking us, well, he's not taking us, we're going, but he has planned the entire trip and the itinerary every day. It's fabulous. It's been great not to have to worry about that. And I've had some really amazing advice from you all about places to visit. And my friend Sue sent me the most wonderful happy mail with so many wonderful um, things that I'm interested in, like the charity shops and um, a booksellers and things like that. So I've added my wish list um, to our itinerary and I'm hoping I'm going to get to go to the Waterloo Bridge book sale and um, go to some of these booksellers and some paper shops and I'm just I'm just so excited. So um, having said that today on Tea With Me I have quite a few things to talk about um, before I go and I'm going to try to stick to about a half an hour and I hope I can fit it in but what I'd like to talk about is um, my trip to Star Island and birding and um, how to adapt a journal that's already made to something you can use last minute and make it a little bit more special. I want to talk about two big hauls I had, one at a library book sale and another at an estate sale, which has some really exciting possibilities for me. And then if I have time, I'd really love to share with you all um, my Mother's Day gift that my husband gave me, which was a microwave um, flower press, which has basically changed everything as far as me gathering flowers and thinking about um, pressed flowers in my journals in ephemera. So I think the best way to start is just, just jump right in. So I'm going to give you guys a second to pause, make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, or if it's at night and you've had a rough day, a cup of a glass of wine or maybe if you even have, haven't had a bad day you just want to have a nice glass of wine so um, I'm gonna move some things around you can press pause make a drink come on back and um, hopefully we can have tea together okay I'm back hopefully you're back too with something to drink and let's jump on in so back in oh gosh I guess it was the last bit of May um, I went on a bird weekend with my mom on an island off the coast of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And essentially, it was a migration study weekend. And I love my backyard birds, but I wouldn't consider myself a birder. But I really wanted this experience and I wanted to spend some time with my mom. So we did it and it was just wonderful. And I had great time with my mom and she's such a trooper. I mean, we didn't have heat. We only had a toilet in a closet for like a whole floor of people. Um, it was really glorified camping, but it was the most spectacular location with some wonderful people. We learned a lot and, um, 
she came up the night before because we had to drive and I wanted to make a little journal for each of us to write about because I knew we were logging birds and it was sort of a naturalist weekend. And she and I haven't had really a chance to do much together with the journals and I didn't have time to really make full journals for us. But I found these journals at Joann's on clearance and I really like them. There was like, they're kind of like a leather cover and it's spiral bound and there's an elastic that goes around the front and I thought I really liked it. So it was like a dollar ninety nine, and I thought these would be perfect for us but I didn't want to adapt mine and hers. I thought she would enjoy doing it. I thought it'd be a fun thing we could do together. So basically what I did was I just made this um I guess book plate, but they're really a lot more, um, they're a lot more busy than what I usually do. And I really loved the process. Um, I had found this video online by Treasure Books and I will link it below. But the name of the video was DIY Book Plates for Junk Journals and Books. And it's basically about covering cardboard and then layering. I have textiles and lace and and it's about also sewing and and um, inking. It, it was just a really fun little project and really gave us the opportunity to personalize our books. We had, I made a few of these. My mom made hers. She really enjoyed it. I would definitely say if you're looking for something to just, um, zhuzh up as Wendy would say your um, journals this is a great project it's also great if you have let's say a book that has something in the center not that I would cover this because it's beautiful but let's say you had something you loved everything about a book but you didn't like the center you could make something that goes over the top that's you know really special and um, this project is a perfect one for that. So um, really quick, all I did was do that and then we put some, oops, we put some inside pockets in with some sewing, one in the front, one in the back. And you know, it was just perfect for taking notes and recording our thoughts and um, you know, drawing some things that we saw. And this was, this was my, um, you know, this was my, my tag that I wore at night. And I, we had played a little game. Uh, one of the gentlemen was a photographer and he gave us bookmarks. So, you know, it was a really fun weekend. And I definitely would say this is a fun little project just if you're going somewhere and you wanted to make something a little bit more special. So I will link that below if you want to do that project. I would definitely say if you're just in the mood for like an hour little um, crafting session, I would, this video is really fun. So that's that. So now I am want to move on a little bit to my library book sale. So I am a um, member of my local library's um, Friends of the Library, and um, I worked our last book sale, and I found some treasures that I have to sh share with you. So I'm not sure if this is the same book that Nick the Booksmith used for her lap book, but it's very similar. It's I was so excited that I bought the whole set of these encyclopedias because there were only seven of them. I think back in the day, they didn't quite separate them out as much as they do now. Um, but this is, look how beautiful this is. This um, this book plate that goes like the, around the whole thing. This is the student's encyclopedia and the copyright, um, original copyright was 1893. But this is the um, 1901. Nope, this is the 1926, 25 or 26 edition. So this is the 1920s. I, I think what is so special about these encyclopedias is the font is so different than um, fonts that are in modern encyclopedias and the illustrations, these black and white illustrations are really amazing. Um, the maps are, are drawn so nice and these little black and white drawings replace what would be photographs in the more modern day ones. 
and just, I mean, look at this. Can you see how lovely that is? I mean, that's terrific. So I bought the whole set. I am definitely not going to need the whole set. So more on that later, but the covers are terrific. They have sort of this, these embossed bound edges on the back, the binding, and it almost gives like a metal feel, but it's not. Uh, there's so much deep embossing on these covers. I don't know if you can see that. But this is definitely the new student's reference work. Uh, it's by the S.L. Whedon Company. And if you're on thrift books or looking for um, really good text fonts and black illustrations, I would look those up. I also found, you know, one of our favorites. Whenever you can find an Edith Holden, it's amazing. And when you find it for a dollar, hello. I mean, whoa, awesome. Okay, and then I, you know, one of the reasons I share books in my videos is because when you all share books in your videos, I can recognize a good book right away. And I believe maybe the Mushroom Market was the one who mentioned this. Um, if I'm wrong, forgive me, but this book, um, the Marshall Cavendish Illustrated Encyclopedia of Gardening is not that thick. There might've been a couple of, I, I think there might've been a couple of, oh yeah, because volume one. Yeah, there's more than one volume. And I did get maybe another volume. But what's really nice in them is, yes, there's a lot of photographs from like the 1970s, but the drawings, um, let me see if I can get you a little bit farther back so you can see. Okay. So see, the dra there's drawings like almost on, a okay, so here's a good example. Yes, we have the, sort of that Instagram filtery photos that you get in a 70s book. I'm going to try to see if I can get closer to this. But do you see these pictures? They're so nice to cut out. And there's so many of them in here. So for a dollar, you know, here's a great little one. This would be great to cut out and put some textile around. I, I love this image. Look at, there's, there's, there's drawings and photographs. That's beautiful right there. You see that? Gorgeous. So this book for the price, if you can get it cheap, is really full of quite a bit that you could you could cut, and and I love that. Also, the Time Life Encyclopedia of Gardening, another '70s <coughs> book, excuse me, that combines um, a lot of drawings with photographs, and this one was, uh, you know, just chuck full lots of pictures but then once you get past that look at that that's a wonderful image the colors are great they're sort of that muted the pages are naturally yellowed um, really great book with lots and lots of things to cut out i mean if you get this for a dollar or two i mean that's just so many things you can cut from there so that's a good one then i found this this was just a surprise and really interesting to me when I found this book, um, I guess I really wasn't familiar, and I'm gonna—I don't even know how to write this. Is it albinus, albinice? I, I, I'm not sure. Um, it's their plates that were made, and I assumed it was like for anatomy and physiology, like for doctor or medical. But it's actually for artists to study how the body is shaped and functions, so that when you're painting, you have the correct proportions. Um, it goes into detail about all, you know, every part of our body, but these pictures are so detailed, these pen and ink pictures, and they're so interesting. I mean, I guess it's for perspective that they put a rhinoceros in the background, but uh, it's just phenomenal. And there's like these great, interesting pictures throughout the book. Um, really cool. I mean, there's the sort of anatomy type of sketch here that 
identifies all the parts of the body, which would be cool for some kind of a curiosity journal or a medical journal. But then these are just kind of gothic and funky and I, I just, I don't know where I'm gonna use it, but I am so gonna use it because this is so cool. And this book is really cool. So, you know, not my typical, you know, we're not talking Edith Holden and our pretty flowers and our botanicals, but really, really cool images. So that book I wanted to share. Um, this is kind of a cool book. First of all, I love the shape and the cover has a moon with um, the migration of geese in Boston. I'm not sure if you can see that, which is really cool. And it's called Thomas P. McElroy Jr., The Habitat Guide to Birding. And what's great about this book is there's no colored pictures, but there's tons of black and white artwork. Um, all birds, beautiful, a nice size too, like a perfect size to cut and put on a cover or to make a journaling tag. Um, really nice black and white images. And um, the paper is yellowed nicely for the age of the book. Probably what it was made out of, it just tends to do that because it's so evenly yellowed. So I'm thinking this paper was never really white. It was always a cream color and maybe it's just become a little bit deeper. This was uh, 1974. So this book too, wonderful book. Um, the last two books I want to share, I got much more than this, but I just really wanted to highlight the books that I thought might be interesting to other people when they're doing searches for books. This is um, a sketch of medicine and pharmacy, and um, it's by S.E. Massengill, M.D. First of all, this cover. This is like so embossed and raised. I wish I could. I can't really do it justice. It's so cool. And um, in, let's see when this was made. This was the third printing in 1943. Um, I think what's so cool about this is there's so many cool things that would be in a um, journal that, you know, maybe was, again, a little bit more of those of us who enjoy a darker journal now and then might enjoy putting a uroscopy in there or um, scurvy. Now, what journal doesn't deserve a little bit of mention of scurvy? Come on now, that's pretty cool. Um, there's just things you're not gonna find in other books and I love anything that's really different. Look at midwifery, that's that's cool. Um, what would, women in medicine, oh, I can only imagine what that chapter's about. And there's just a lot of really interesting text that I, I, I find humorous and interesting and um, dentistry, you know, poisons. How about a list of poisons, people? Snakes in medicine? Uh, duh. Come on. That's, that's fabulous. The mystic sacred snake. I know right now you people are like, shut that book. I... I just, just get it out. There's no place for this in junk journals. Well, you know, I'm a little bit weird, so I kind of do like a, a weird junk journal from now, now and then. Um, and I have a couple going right now, so I like that. And last but not least, this is one of my favorite books. This is my big recommendation. I'm not sure who first brought Edith Holden to the forefront, but this is the book that I'm constantly telling people about. It's called Flowering Plants of the World. Um, being in America, we don't have those gorgeous botanical books that you all have in the UK. Um, we can get them, but you know we just don't seem to have the same ones. This is the closest one I have found. This is a very modern edition. And what was interesting and why I bring this one up because I have mentioned this before, is I wanted to see what a modern edition looked like versus the ones I have, which were in the 70s. And the 70s had, the paper was sort of matte. It was a really thick kind of um, cardstock, and the color was beautiful. I always recommend getting the 70s version of this book first. However, when I saw this at the book sale and I saw that they were um, just withdrawing it from their collection, I had to get it because 
I, I didn't care whether it was old or new. I knew the pictures were going to be beautiful, but I was curious how it compared to the books that I'm always searching for of this edition in the 70s. So this one is, let's see, 1993. So this is quite a bit different. This is 20 years different from the one I recommend. The paper definitely is not as thick or robust as the paper that we get in the 70s edition, but they are the same pictures. Um, this one seems to have some yellowing, even though it's... Um, it's almost got that, I wish I could, the, the mimeograph paper, I'm so dating myself, but it has sort of this smooth feel to it. And that has that, which means that it will yellow quite quickly, which is good. And I mean, it's all the same pictures that are in the other book. I would say they're not as rich as they are in the book that I recommend, but certainly this book, even, this would probably be better for like just book pages in a journal. The other one ha is, has such a cardstock quality. It's great for pockets and envelopes and more sturdier things. Not that you couldn't use it for a book page, but I would not feel bad about using these as book pages. I often feel guilty about using um, the other books in, as book pages because the paper so beautiful. I think this is a little bit smaller than in the 70s edition. I want to say that takes half the page and this is maybe more like a third or 40 percent of the page. I'm looking for the full page spreads. There they are. Okay so here's a full page spread. Let me see if I can move these books so you can see the whole thing. So here's a full page spread. As you can see lots of beautiful um, pictures to either just say this whole page or fussy cut. They're still gorgeous like in um, the book that I usually use from the 70s. So if you see this book, I would definitely get it no matter what the age is because you're not gonna be disappointed with the artwork. It's called Flowering Plants of the World um, by Haywood, the editor. And um, a great book to look up on thrift books, amazon.com, get it for a few bucks. I would say, there are so many images and there's so much paper in this book. For this particular book um, in the 90s, I would say even any, I would pay up to probably $7 for this book. Um, for the other one, I would pay 10 or 12 because you know, it's more than what you're gonna get in a paper pad. And I mean, look at this, this is just terrific. So that is my haul from the library. So now I need a sip of tea before I continue because I have a story. Oh, do I have a story. Okay. So I can't go into the, to all of the details, but I will say that I follow a lot of people on Instagram. I follow a lot of people on YouTube and I see the things that they're working with. And I have long admired, on occasion, been a little jealous of the things that people can find. And I always wonder how do they find these things? They're these treasures. I'm not seeing these treasures in thrift stores and my antique stores. I, I might find a little here and there, but you know, first of all, the cost at an antique store is pretty high. And I don't find these collections of wonderful things at, at like yard sales. I might stumble upon a treasure from time to time, but in general, I'm not finding these things that people sell or that people use and, you know, I'm wondering what I'm doing wrong. So I started going to estate sales and that really is the key, going to estate sales. And if you're in the United States, you can go on, I think it's estatesale.com or something and they'll find the ones near you. And I'll give you more details on this in the future because I, I, I don't know that I'm at liberty to really say yet but I made a wonderful contact with a wonderful person in the estate sale business. And I talked to her about what I did and asked her if she ever came across things that I was looking for, if she could ping me. And, you know, people are busy. They're, they often are, say, sure, 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 and you know, you're forgotten about. But she did. I mean, how incredible is that she did? She. She let me know that they were working on an estate sale of a family in 
New, New Hampshire that did not come from New Hampshire. And this family, um, the person who owned the house, was responsible for the entire history of generations of that family. And they were, it was all in one place and it was all in that house. And that person passed away and the spouse of that person felt the responsibility of all of this stuff. Obviously there was nobody to give it to. So they were, um, they were getting rid of it in an estate sale. And now I understand that the family or the, the, the person running the estate sale needs to make money so that of course they want to sell a lot and the person who owned the stuff of course wants to sell a lot but I think that there is a certain amount of um, peace that comes with knowing that the items that are going are going to be cherished, used, recycled, admired, um, and understood for the value that they have because you know a lot of people look at at estate sales in other than precious, you know, treasures and antiques, they think the rest is junk and it's not junk. It's history. It's, it tells a story of a family, but it also tells a story of a time. And the fact that this family carefully preserved everything, I mean, I would hate to see all of that just go. So she contacted me and told me about the sale. And of course it's when I'm in London, which broke my heart. And I asked if I could make an appointment to come see it. And of course, they don't do that. They only do that for large volumes of um, people that are in the business, you know. So she asked me, you know, would I ever consider having a business so that, you know, I could make appointments and things like that. And I had toyed with it, but, you know, it's one of those things that you're maybe not sure of or you maybe don't have confidence in or you know, you can talk yourself out of. But this year, my word for the year is faith. And I believe that, you know, the universe kind of puts things in front of us because, um, you know, it it's um, giving us an opportunity. So I called one of my best friends who is also very interested in this stuff and asked her if she wanted to go into business with me. And she said she did. And we made an appointment and we made an investment and we bought a big chunk of their collection. And I'm not gonna show you the collection, it would take me hours. It's gonna take us months to go through everything that we purchased and inventory it and see what we have. But I am so excited about this fall, doing something where we can share so much of this with you digitally and maybe physically. Um, I'm trying to still figure that out. Um, hold on, the phone's ringing. Let me pause that. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that, everyone. So I said I wanted to keep this video short, and it's not, and it's probably over a half an hour now. So I'm just going to um, try to move this along. So basically, the long and the short of it is, um, is I stumbled across the opportunity to find all the things that I have been admiring and looking for from um, so many of you out there. And I can't wait to share it with you. There are some truly spectacular things in this collection. But I wanted to just give you a teeny tiny taste of um, what I have uh, found in the boxes so far. So let's start with books. There are beautiful books. And when you go to an estate sale, you can, uh, you can oftentimes get a sense of what was the priority for a family or what their hobbies were. So sometimes you'll find fabric and laces and sewing machines and notions and know that, you know, the, the people that live there really were all about making things with their hands and sewers, quilters, seamstresses. Um, sometimes you'll find, um, you know, people that you know probably came from the depression because all the buttons are cut off, all the laces are preserved. Um, other play, other estate sales you'll see like military memorabilia or sporting goods and baseball cards. This sale was all about words, all about books, all about paper, all about communication. 
There's um, so much of that. So this collection, this, this family had books in every room, hundreds, thousands of books. So I went through them and I took some of the books that I thought were the most special. Um, I'm just showing you a teeny tiny, just a couple. Um, this one here is the Songs of Nature and it's poetry from, um, from uh, American poets, but it's a beautiful book with, you know, really nice gilding in it. It's got that sort of um, ragged edged paper. It's got beautiful, beautiful um, little printing. And I love how all the pages are marked for the favorite entries and even some of the favorite lines are, are written. This family was journalers. They would have been original junk journalers because they had scrapbooks. They had journals. They, the women journaled about everything. There was recipe journals. There were um, glue books. There were newspaper journals. There was, if you, you name it, there was a journal about it, and um, we we purchased a lot of them. So, you know, books like this that are in wonderful condition, um, beautiful, beautiful covers. I love the color cover on this um, with book plates in them and beautiful type. Lots of these. I'm going to show more books in the future. Um, games with little tiny cards. You know, I do wonder though, this particular little set was buried in a box of another set of cards. And there were a couple cards that I'm not showing on camera because they're so um, racist. I mean, that's there's no other way to say it. It's from a different time. Um, and it's horrifying to me that this was part of a children's game. But I'm curious, I, I really like to know, what do you guys do when you find things that are really politically incorrect now for the day and that you know kind of bred that hatred that we have in the world um do you keep it do you get rid of it do you sell it do, what, what do you do with it i don't know what to do with it anyway cute little cards these books were take were not in good condition obviously they don't even have a cover but you know look at these images like of that dragonfly so much i can do with that so there was lots of like naturalist type of things not a lot of um embroidery but some but i had to show you this one because i thought this was such a beautiful piece so i do have some um laces and some embroidery finally some playing cards why has this eluded me so I have people that say, no more playing cards. Oh, all I found was playing cards. Oh, more playing cards. And I say, I don't have any, none, zero. I find bicycles, big deal. I find the ones that are just have the boring plates. I finally found a really pretty one. Um, 180 Congress Pinochle playing cards. And I think it has Abigail Adams on it. How cute. And they're so nicely yellowed. And I did get some other cards too, which I um, will show in a future video. Postcards. The most beautiful postcards I have ever seen at this house. And I got tons of them. Look at these beautiful ladies. Oh my gosh. The paper feels fabulous. The colors are fabulous. I mean, look at that. Look at her. Isn't she stunning? And these are just phenomenal. A collection like this, I think I'm gonna make into digitals because they are just too beautiful not to share. Um, lots of cards like this. Look at that image. Look at that. That just makes me so happy. I These type of things have eluded me for so long. To actually hold one just makes me excited. This is great. Don't know what it is. Hoping one of you can help me solve the mystery. Um, on the, it says the Beckard line, number 084 on it. It's quite old. Now, he was a reverend, so I don't know if this has anything to do with anything, but I'm just putting it out there. These papers are all like this. I think they could be sort of like invitations or, I don't know, look at, they're like, they have these little dots. It's a beautiful like linen handmade paper almost like. You open it and then inside is this 
like inserted paper, see that, that you can write on. Are these not beautiful? And can't you see these as a lovely part of a journal? There's a whole stack of them. I don't know what they're used for. I'd love to know more. Even the envelope is beautiful. Okay, my heart stopped when I saw this book. First of all, it's just so gorgeous on the back. It's just aged beautiful. Look at the person who owned it. Made sure to put their initials on it. At first I thought it was handwritten, but now I think it's printed. Look at this marbled paper. And I could, you can even feel the marbling on it. You can feel the texture. It's just tremendous. Um, 1843 is when this person got the book. You can still see the original twine in the book. And look at this writing. Look at it. It's just amazing. The paper's amazing. The the numbers in the corner are amazing. At first I thought it was a hand on diary. I'm thinking it could be printed. I, I don't know. I need to know more about this. This book just captured my heart. Look at it. it it's just amazing. Amazing. We have a lot of mid-century, great little graphics, um, so much that I have to share with you guys for Christmas journals, beautiful things, a lot of vintage New York City um, ephemera, which I can't wait to share with you. So much personal ephemera, like they kept everything, packing lists for camping, so sweet. Um, they had their own printing business, so um, these are embossed from their business. Lots of beautiful, oops, sorry, papers, uh, ledger paper that are blank, ready to be used. You know, original composition books with beautiful paper in it. I mean, look at this. This is graph paper. So lots of every kind of paper, every kind of ephemera, letters, correspondence, just wonderful things. So I just can't wait to share all this with you and what my plans are for it. So last but not least, and I will try to make this quick, and if you are interested in more of a demonstration on this, then I will make a video just about this. But I wanted to share with you this product. So my husband knew that I was very interested in pressing flowers and um, I had paper sticking out of so many of our books in our house. I mean, it was pretty hard not to see it. He bought me this for Mother's Day and he got it off of Amazon and I will link that in the description below. And I had been looking at one and I actually had watched some videos online about it and was intrigued. I was shocked that he um, even knew to do this, which how sweet is that, that he paid that much of attention to what I was doing, and here it is. And basically all it is, is two nice thick plates that are sort of like this hard, I guess, um, kind of like a plastic, and then two foam plates, and then these two like linen pieces of paper. Now, uh, piece, two linen pieces of um, fabric. Now, this looks like I've not had any regard for anything and just putting the flowers on there. Believe it or not, I've had paper in between this and this is still how it is. I'm gonna have to wash this soon. So the process is this. You take a plate, then you take a pad, and then you take a piece of um, the linen, and then you could put the flowers directly on here, but the video I watched suggested that you take tissue paper and you put the tissue paper down and then you put the flowers, you lay the flowers down and then you put the linen on top, the other pad and then the other plate. And then you just secure them with these little plastic, like um, you have to make sure it's all lined up or it doesn't go on. These like little plastic holders like this and then you microwave it in bursts for about a minute. And they come out as good, if not better, than the ones that you're putting in books for weeks. Oops, sorry, Abigail. Um, 
the smell can be a little bit gnarly at times, depending on the flour. It smells like you're cooking salad. But um, I, it's so easy just to grab a handful of flowers and spend a half an hour doing this and then putting them in. I have this whole box is now full of just pressed flowers. And that's just since Mother's Day. And I've had mixed results, you know, but let's see, let's compare one, shall we? Um, I'm gonna get one that I got from a book. So this flower I did in a book. It was a blossom from the cherry tree next to our house. And this took a, you know, I, it probably was in a book for two weeks. So that's the detail of one. This is the same flower that I did um, in one minute. And I think the difference is, I think there might be a little bit more detail in this one than in that one, I would say. But they're very similar. And this preserved the little center a little bit better. I think some flowers um, do better. And there is a learning curve, but I'll do another side by side. Let's see what I have here. So all of these flowers, I have already put in acetate, and they were all done in my microwave. And I think the leaves come out spectacular. Look at the detail. I'm gonna go upside down, sorry. Look at the um, detail on that. And that was done like in, in just, look at the, the fern. It was just done in like a minute, you know? And it's so intact. From what I hear, the, the colors in the microwave press hold better than colors in a book. Um, I'm going to see if I can find a colorful one for us. So this would be a buttercup. Oh no, this is um, actually a little violet. And this is a violet as well. I'm learning. There, There is a a learning curve to it. This was an iris petal. And you can see how delicate it is, but I mean, you can handle them quite nicely. Let's see what this one was. Oh, this was a um, columbine. So I did this columbine in my microwave and I thought that the detail came out quite nice. Did you see that? So I definitely recommend this product. It's not cheap. I was glad that he got it for me for Mother's Day because I probably wouldn't have bought it for myself. These are all flocks. Look at all the flocks I did. I did probably this whole thing of flocks in two minutes. Now, of course, I had to go out and cut them and I had to lay them on the sheet, but really look at how many I did in such a short amount of time. It, it's really great. So I definitely recommend this product. There is a little bit of a learning curve, but it's not hard. It's more the learning curve is, oh, I can't do white flowers for a minute because they turn brown. Or, hmm, if there's a big bulbous part of it, I need to kind of snip that off because it stinks and there's too much water in there. But that's the kind of stuff. It's just stuff you get as you go on particular flowers. So that's about it. Um, this video went much longer than I thought, and I apologize for that. Um, but hopefully there were some nuggets of information in here that um, were helpful to you, either a video you want to watch, a book you want to buy, or um, a product that you want to check out. And as far as my huge estate sale haul, um, there's going to be a lot more in the months ahead with that. I am so excited to start this little business. And... Um, I will definitely keep you guys posted and probably ask your advice at times. And I'm really hoping I can bring some things to you all that maybe you're having a hard time finding because I know how frustrating it is when you want to find something and everybody seems to have it and you don't. Um, and it's not that you're so envious of them. It's just you don't you want to try these things and you don't have the materials. You can't just go to Michael's and buy an antique set of cards. Um, and a lot of times you don't need a whole set of cards. You only need two or three. So I'm really hoping to start the business from a junk journaler point of view so that it's very um, helpful to you guys and you have access to things that you want that will be very affordable. 
So that's it. The next time I talk to you, I will be back from London. I can't wait to tell you about my journeys and my travels and my adventures and show you some things. And um, I appreciate you hanging out with me and have a great rest of June. I will see you for tea in July. Bye-bye.